The New York Yankees have been a, a premier American sports franchise for over 100 years now. Of course, baseball isn't like other sports. Other sports really, uh, they look for parity and they look for a uh, fair playing field for all teams. But baseball doesn't do that. Baseball loves its powerhouses. So they allow teams with the most money to buy the best players. And that's exactly what the Yankees have done for years. And they attract as many good players as they possibly can. It doesn't mean they win all the time, but they certainly have an advantage. In 1919, the Yankees bought Babe Ruth from the Boston Red Sox for $100,000. Ruth went on to have a pretty good career. In 1930, Babe demanded a pay raise from the Yankees that would pay him more than President Hoover. When questioned about his demands, Ruth said, I deserve it. I had a better year. And he was right. But through the years, the Yankees have consistently attracted stellar players, some homegrown, some by trade, some through free agency, and the list is impressive. You look at Lou Gehrig and Joe DiMaggio and Mickey Mantle and, and the man who just broke the single-season non-steroid era home run record for a season, a guy named Aaron Judge. How many people watched Aaron Judge break that record? Anybody? It's awesome. Aaron Judge was born in my hometown of Sacramento. i got to give him a shout-out. It's great. But one of the most famous Yankee personalities wasn't a player. He was a manager. His name was Casey Stingle. How many people heard of Casey Stingle? Casey Stingle was a great manager, and he was hired by the Yankees in 1949. And in his first five years, he won the World Series five straight times. Now, no team has ever done that before since, won the World Series five straight times. Casey Stingle did it in his first five years. He ended up winning 10 pennants in 12 years as the Yankee manager and seven World Series titles. And the question that everyone wanted to ask him, especially the managers for the Yankees that came after him, was how do you get all those high-priced, large-ego players to play as a team? And he had an answer for that. Casey would say this. He said, on any team, there are 15 guys that will run through a wall for you. Those are the good guys. Five who are just out for themselves. Those are the losers. And five who are undecided. He said, when you make out your rooming list for road games, always room the losers together. Never room a good guy or an undecided guy with a loser. Keep the losers isolated so that their disease doesn't spread. He said, you see, it's much easier to pull people down than it is to lift people up. We're in a series called Counterattack, and we've been talking about how we as Christians can counterattack the darkness of our culture here in 2022, a culture that's hostile to God, a culture that's hostile to the things of God and the people of God. Everyone is just out for themselves. It's a loser culture. Sadly, Christians often share a room with the people in this culture. They allow this culture to influence us drag us down to its darkness and to its depravity. We forget the words of Casey Stengel, which by coincidence or intention is the wisdom of God, which is be careful. Be careful. Don't allow the disease of this culture to influence you. Influence it instead. Amen? And that's exactly, that dynamic is exactly what's happening in Nehemiah chapter 5 and 6. And if you have your Bible or you have your pad or whatever, you, your phone, turn to Nehemiah chapter 5 right now. If you're just new to us here, uh, we've been studying the book of Nehemiah because Nehemiah led a counterattack in a culture war that is similar to ours. And in the first four chapters, he showed us the arrows in his quiver. He showed us the arrows that he shot from his bow, the arrows that pierced the darkness of, this, uh, of, this, of his enemies. Uh, lies, and let the light of God, God shine through. And you can uh, look in those. Uh, we had four messages, and they're all found on our website, nbcfamily.com, and you can listen to them or watch them if you want. Now we're in chapter 5. And in chapter 5, Nehemiah faced a new problem. The darkness of the enemy's culture was influencing his people, 
the remnant. Jews were taking advantage of other Jews. Their culture was becoming no better than the one they were fighting against. They were ripping each other off. They were manipulating the poor for their own ends. They were even selling some of the poor as slaves to get more money. That was the Jewish culture under Nehemiah. It was a complete mess. And Nehemiah's response to that is found in chapter 5. Look at verse 9. He said this, So I continued, What you were doing is not right. Shouldn't you walk in the fear of our God and avoid the reproach of our Gentile enemies? In other words, he said, you're no better than them. You're no better than our enemies. Why are we even fighting? What's the point? When we don't walk in the fear of the Lord, which is saying when we don't walk wisely or when we don't walk in the ways of God, we give our enemy a foothold. And we open up a path for our enemy to neutralize us, to, to render us ineffective, irrelevant, insignificant. Which I got to tell you is exactly what we could say about the Christian church today. Today, in America. What are we doing? Truly, what are we doing? I, I mean, without a doubt, the, the woke, anti God, anti life, anti science cancel culture, that's frightening. But are we providing an, a better alternative as the Christian church? Or are we just moving in their direction? See, far too often, it seems like we're moving in the direction of the enemy instead of the enemy moving in our direction. I look at Christian colleges, and I look at uh, mainline denominations, the big ones, and I look at their agenda, and i got to tell you, you the first question I ask is, what's the difference? What's the difference between them and the culture we live in? My answer is not much. Not much got to understand the sole reason we, the remnant, the Christian church, exist is the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's it. The gospel of Jesus Christ. To communicate that message, the good news that Jesus died for our sins, the good news that there's forgiveness, the good news that we can be reconciled to the Almighty God. Amen to that? That's why we exist. But somehow in our current Christian culture, that's been pushed to the back. That's been hid in a closet. The Christian culture and the agenda, it looks that they have it, it looks very similar to the one that our culture offers. In essence, we're trading the eternal for the temporary. We trumpet issues that are meaningless without Christ, worthless without the salvation that only comes through Jesus Christ our Lord. I got to tell you, I read publications from Christian universities or I read bulletins from from denominations, and the talk is this, social justice, racial reconciliation, inclusion, equity, climate change. And I don't care where you stand on those issues. Are those the church issues? I mean, justice, clean air, clean water are good things. And let me tell you something, every race should be celebrated, and we do here at NBC. Praise God for that. That's great. Those are all wonderful. But we need to remember that there is no forgiveness for our past sins without Jesus Christ. None. We need to remember that there's no making this world right without the resurrection power of Jesus Christ. We need to remember that there's no lasting change without the one who determines what lasts and what changes. Jesus Christ. I mean, you want to talk climate change? Let me show you climate change. Revelation chapter 8. Here's climate change. <laughs> Verse 7. There came hail and fire mixed with blood, and it was hurled down on the earth. The earth, a third of the earth was burned up, a third of the trees were burned up, and all the green grass was burned up. A huge mountain, all ablaze, was thrown into the sea. A third of the sea turned to blood. A third of the living creatures in the sea died. A third of the waters turned bitter, and many people died from the waters that had become bitter. A a third of the sun was struck. A third of the moon. A third of the stars. A third of them turned dark. Now that's climate change. (laughs) And that's just the beginning of the end. And who is in control of climate change? Well, John chapter 1 tells us. John chapter 1, verse 3. 
through him, Jesus, all things were made. Without him, nothing that was made has been made. Jesus created the earth. Let me say that again. Jesus created the earth, and he's in control of the earth. He's in control of its climate. He's in control of its changes. He's in control of its beginning. He's in control of its end, which is why our message must be about Jesus, first and foremost, first and last, first and forever, Jesus. Our focus must be Jesus, not political issues. And I know I get criticized all the time for not being very vocal politically, but I don't want to trade the eternal for the temporary. I really don't. It doesn't matter. Politics won't last. And politics doesn't change the hearts of men. Do you know that? The Bible tells us that. You know who changes the hearts of men? Jesus Christ. So our message will always be Jesus. Jesus. Without Jesus, and I've said this before, we're just rearranging deck chairs on the Titanic. We're we're just washing dishes on the Hindenburg. We're just mopping up spilled milk on the Exxon Valdez. All of those things are nice, but they don't mean a hell of beans. Those vehicles are going down. This culture, it's going down. Our message is Jesus Christ. Jesus said this in Mark chapter 8, For what is the profit of man to gain the whole world yet? What's that? Yeah. The focus of the remnant, us, must be eternal life. Brought by Jesus and Jesus alone. I mean, we live in the temporary, but you got to understand that the temporary only gets better when we're on the right road to the eternal. It's the only time it gets better. Otherwise, it's useless. And getting on the right road to the eternal only comes when you, when you have the realization of your sin. That you're a sinful person and I'm a sinful person. But we can be saved through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Amen? And we'll constantly trumpet that here. But we need the acknowledgement of sin and the acknowledgement of our Savior. People need to know that. If you push that behind, all the solutions are temporary. There was a news report recently about a, uh, it was a middle school in Michigan. And they were facing a troubling problem. A number of the 12-year-old girls had recently started putting lipstick on. And they'd meet in the girls' bathroom, and they'd put lipstick on, and they thought it was cool. And then they would kiss the mirror, and they'd leave lips, red lips on the mirror. And they'd love that. They thought that was cool. And the janitor would have to come in and clean it every night. And then they'd clean it, and then he'd come in the next day, and they were back. They were back. All the lips were back on the mirror. And the principal finally got involved because he, you know, was taking the time of the janitor every single night. So he thought, well, I got to come up with a solution to the problem. And he did. And he brought the 12, 12-year-old girls into the bathroom. And he had the janitor there. And he told the girls, he goes, hey, this is a big problem. You can't be kissing the mirror all the time. It's causing him a lot of work to clean it. And he looked at the janitor. He goes, show him how much work he got to do. And the janitor grabbed a big, long squeegee. And he put the squeegee in the toilet. Then he wiped the mirror. There was never any lip marks on the mirror again. (laughs) Problem solved. My point is, people got to know about their sin. And you can tell them creatively, but people got to know about their sin. And that because they're a sin, sinful being, they need a Savior. Jesus Christ, amen? Got to know that. It's true. And that good news about Jesus is not a temporary solution. Permanent. It's eternal. And when we concentrate on temporary solutions, do you know what? Our solutions are no better than our cultures. They're no. They might be different, but they're not better because they're temporary. Gone with the wind. 
And guess what? That's exactly where Satan wants us. He wants us concentrating on the temporary. That's where he wants us. He wants us dwelling on the world. And in fact, he wants a world totally focused on the world. That's what he wants. That's when he wins. Get rid of the eternal. Get rid of Jesus. Just focus on your little problems here. And he is, and his armies, his armies of darkness, will do anything to keep us focused on the temporary. And we see that with Nehemiah. If you were here the last four weeks, you realize that their, their first attacks were overt attacks. They were public insults and ridicules. They're just yelling things at Nehemiah and the people. You guys will never do this. This, this wall will never go up. And, and they're just, that's all they were doing, kind of overt attacks in your face. But it didn't work. And so now they're going to go covert in chapter 5. And the attacks are no longer sharpened swords of ridicule or, or catapults of flaming scorn. They're pulling back. They're, they're softening their tone. They're bringing the volume down a little bit, but the deceit up. And they're trying to lull their prey into a false sense of security before they strike. Turn over and look at Nehemiah 6. We'll start at verse 1. It says this, when word came to send Balat, Tobiah, Geshem, the Arab, and the rest of our enemies that I had rebuilt the wall and not left a gap in it, though, the, though up until that time I had not set the doors in the gates, Sam Balat and Geshem sent me this message. Come, let us meet together in one of the villages on the plains of Ono. Bonus tip for the day, never meet your enemy on the plains of Ono. Just saying, you might want to write that down. But if you've been with us the whole series, you know that Sembalat, Tobiah, and Geshem were lieutenants in the armies of darkness. And they've been throwing all kinds of spears at Nehemiah and the Jews. It's the spear of public shaming and ridicule and all that kind of stuff while they were trying to rebuild God's holy city. <clears throat> but it didn't work, and the walls kept going up. So now they go from overt to covert, from blatant, blatant hatred to, hey, let's get together. Let's get together. And that's the thing. If the enemy can't destroy you, he's going to try to distract you. And that's what they're trying to do. Distract them. Learn them to the plains of, oh, no. And they'll do anything to get us off of uh, God's work. Distract our eyes from God's work. The art of distraction. So they say to Nehemiah, come, let's meet. Come, let's sit down and talk. Let's have some coffee. Come. See, they see that the wall is done, but the gates haven't been done, and so they're kind of panicking now. Well, they haven't completed the gates, so, you know, well, we got to go to plan B. Plan A didn't get that wall done. The wall, wall went up anyway. Let's go to plan B, distract. They said, let's meet in the plains of Oh, no. And you know what our response today to our culture is? Okay. Let's meet. Let's meet. We meet with our enemy on the plains of oh, no. We stop building the wall. We stop doing what God wants us to do. We say, well, you know what? The enemy, they're being compassionate. They're feeding the homeless. They're doing all kinds of things. They're providing for the disadvantaged. There's nothing wrong with that. And there is nothing wrong with that. Unless it causes you to stop building the wall. Unless it causes you to put Jesus in the closet. Just don't talk about him. Don't talk about Jesus. When you talk about Jesus, oh, no. You got to understand that I believe the social justice movement in churches today that is rampant in churches today is one of the, the absolute most dangerous things I've ever seen in my lifetime. It could be the most dangerous thing the church has ever, ever dealt with because it seems so nice. I mean, why wouldn't we want to do that? It seems so nice, but it has nothing to do with Jesus. And Jesus gets pushed in the back. And churches love this but it's a threat to the mission of the church. We say, hey, that's a, that's a great thing. Let's, let's, let's jump at that agenda because it sounds good. 
We've gone so far, the Christian church in America has gone so far, that we start gathering together as faith communities. Maybe you've heard that. It's, it's around everywhere. Let's get together as a faith community. you got your Christians and your Muslims and your Hindus and your Mormons and your, you pick one, your atheists, your Unitarians. Let's all get together as a faith community and take care of the city. Feed the poor. Combat poverty. Provide meals, clothing, school supplies. It sounds great, doesn't it? Doesn't that sound great? I mean, if you're not for that, you're not very compassionate. But dare I say, what does it profit a man to get one meal when they'll be eternally hungry? And I know some of you will say, but Jesus said, hey, whatever you do to the least of these, you do for me. But Jesus never said, hey, and leave out the gospel. Hey, and don't talk about me. Never, ever. Jesus fed and shared the gospel. Jesus helped and shared the gospel. Jesus healed and shared the gospel every time. He was very clear about our mission. Go make disciples. Which is different than go make a meal. I know that's hard to hear. But that's our mission. Our mission here is to be beautiful feet. It comes from the Bible. The Bible says beautiful are the feet of those who share the good news, who bring the good news. It doesn't say beautiful are the feet of those who bring a meal. And don't get me wrong. We need to bring meals. Don't get me wrong. We need to care for the poor. Don't get me wrong. We need to help out in whatever creative way we can help people out. But we need to bring the gospel. We cannot put Jesus on the back shelf. Jesus is not an afterthought to our mission as a, the Christian church. God didn't start this church just for temporary solutions to earthly problems. It was always about an eternal solution to all of your problems. That's hard to hear sometimes. Because we want to be compassionate. The most compassionate thing we can is to give somebody a meal and then give them a message. Jesus loves you. He died for you. It's hard when we just kind of put them in, well, you know what, they'll see that I'm good. Well, are you good just like the Muslims are good, just like the atheists are good, just like the Unitarians are good? Again, what's the difference in your agenda? If it's all just social justice. That's why I love the ministries we support. And I hate to name some. I'm going to name some. I'll lift you out. I'll leave some out. And if you're part of those ministries I leave out, I apologize to you. But Eastgate Ministry, awesome ministry. AvaCare, awesome ministry. Greater Hope, awesome ministry. And, and we support these ministries and others. You know Why? Because they not just take care of temporary needs, they do. On their way to sh- taking every opportunity to show people the gospel. When they get permission to speak in people's lives, they do. Amen? Amen. Great ministries of support. They look for every opportunity to steer people to Christ. You guys need to pray for a lady named Lauren Arbogast. She is our new director of our, what we call community feed ministry. It's how we go out into the community and serve people and share the name of Jesus Christ. She's got a tough job. It is very hard to find anything where it's not just feeding people and, oh no, don't say Jesus. Just feed. Just take care of their temporary needs. It's hard to do. So pray for her. Join her. Sign up for that ministry. Come alongside her. Get creative with her. And I'm not talking about being a bait and switch church because I can't stand bait and switch church. You know what a bait and switch church is? Hey, we're going to feed you, but you you got to have to listen to an hour of my sermon. Well, that's lame. 
or I'll give you a meal, but let me, let me you know, let, let me try to share with you about Jesus or you're going to die. And you go off on your diatribe somewhere. That's a bait and switch. We need to be creative. How do you do that? Counting on you guys. Because there's not a lot of options. It's hard. You know why it's hard? We're in a battle. And Satan wants to keep Jesus out of it. So he's got this thing called, and there is no doubt in my mind, the social justice movement has come straight for Satan. Because the social justice movement has nothing to do with Jesus Christ. It's a temporary fix. To find those things and say, hey, you know, and it might be just as simple as, hey, you go to somebody, you feed him and say, you know what, I, I love taking care of your physical needs, but I also want to take care of your spiritual needs. And maybe invite him some. Maybe just hand him your invited card. Say, Jesus Christ is who you need to know to, to take care of your eternity. Love to have you. Come to our church sometime. Maybe it's as simple as that. I don't know. You guys are more creative than me. But I know one thing. I don't want to put Jesus on the shelf. Amen? I don't want to put Jesus in the closet. And that's what we do. And that's what churches have been doing. And you look at their bulletins and you look at the Christian college agenda. It's no different from our culture. You can't tell the difference. Jesus is gone. Or he's just another head on a bunch of idols. He is not the Savior. He's one of them. If we do this with our the climate, if we do this with races, let me tell you, I don't care what race you are. You are welcome here. I don't care what, how you vote. You're welcome here. I don't care where you side on the climate change. You're welcome here. Just know that we'll be talking about Jesus every Sunday because I care about your eternal life much more than I care about the minute that you're sitting on this earth. And that's what Nehemiah was dealing with. Uh, a people, the Jewish people that started acting just like the culture they were living in. It was just like, uh, what's going on? You want to know what compassion is? Compassion is knowing that somebody's going to die eternally and trying to help them out of that while you're feeding them. That's what real compassion is. God's eternal compassion at work is our focus. Which is why Nehemiah had this response to his enemy's invitation to come sit down with them. The end of chapter or end of verse 2 says this. But they were scheming to harm me. So they gave me an invitation, but they were scheming to harm me. He knew it was that this meeting was a distraction. So I sent messengers to them with this reply. I'm carrying on a great project and cannot go down. I love that. That could be my life verse, truly. Think about it. Because each of us have different projects that we're doing for Jesus. I'm carrying on a great project and can't literally go down to what the solutions of this culture is. Why should I work or stop the work while I leave and go down to you? Four times they sent me the same message, and each time I gave them the same answer. Why should God's work, God's great project stop while I go down? Four times he gets this invitation. Four times he says one word, no. 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 You know what? That's a great word for every Christian to put in our quiver. It's a great arrow. No. No. We need to say no to the enemy when he wants to pull us away, distract us away from God's work in our life. Whatever God's got you doing to accomplish his purposes, we need to say no. No is a big time word. No is a strong shield that defends off many attacks, many distractions. It takes skill to say no. It takes practice to say no. In fact, let's practice it right now. Say no. no. That's right. You got it. No. Who wants to preach for me next week? See, you practice good. You got it. No. You do that pretty well. Let me give you another word you need to, to, to know. Yes. Say yes. 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 You need to say yes to God. You say no to the enemies, you need to say yes to God. Simple as that. 
which means you got to be in tune with God. You got to know what God's bringing your way. You got to be aligned with God, know what his purposes are. I mean, think about the opportunities that God has given you to accomplish as a purpose. Were you ready to say yes? Or were you doing something that you should have said no to? Were you ready to say yes for God? Nehemiah says no to his enemies, and he says yes to God. And he keeps building the wall. And that's the thing about our counterattack with our culture that we live in today. Yes and no are important arrows in your bow. Yes and no are important arrows in your bow to shoot. We need to say yes to, and we say no to the enemy. Yes to God, no to the enemy. And that sounds simple. It really does when you think about it, but it's not. It's not. Do you know that most people, they get swept up in our culture, whether they go to a Christian church or a Christian university, you know that most people that get swept up don't say yes or no. Sounds simple to say those, but they don't. You don't usually find people that say, you know what, yeah, when we went toward immorality, I said yes to that. No, they just got swept up in the culture that went that direction. And they didn't say no. And they didn't say yes to God. They didn't say anything. That's why it's important. Yes and no are important arrows in your bow. I don't say that lightly because we usually don't say either. We just get caught up in the flow of our culture. There's a reason why most, not, I mean, it's over 50% of the denominations poof, have left Jesus out of anything they do. That's sad. And it's true because they haven't said yes to God and no to the enemy. They're swept up in a culture, a culture that is led by the enemy. And they just drift, whatever they, the way that wind blows. Nehemiah drifts nowhere. Nowhere. He knew that the only reason his enemies wanted to meet him was to stop him from continuing God's work. So four times he said yes to God and, and no to them. Yes, no you. Yes, God. No to my enemies. Verse 5. Then the fifth time, Sam Ballas sent his aid to me with the same message. And in his hand was an unsealed letter in which was written, It is reported among the nations that Geshem says it's true. Well, if Geshem says it's true, it must be true. That you and the Jews are plotting to revolt. And therefore you're building a wall. Moreover, according to these reports, you are about to become their king. And have even appointed prophets to make this proclamation about you in Jerusalem. There is a king in Judah. Now this report will get back to the king. What king will it get back to? The king of Persia. The king that's paying for the wall to be built. The king that has favor on Nehemiah. See, this is a threat. They're saying, man, you, you must want to be king yourself. You just want to overthrow the government. This is right out of today's headlines. Right out of today's headlines. Make up lies about the motives of the remnant. Make up lies about people of faith. We're not compassionate. We're not tolerant. We hate people who make choices that we don't agree with. We hate those people. You heard those things? Still out there? No, it's hard to hear. It's true. Lies like, we don't like this country, what's going on in this country, so we're planning a revolt, an insurrection, whatever it is. Nehemiah's response to that, verse 8. And I sent him this reply. Nothing like what you were seeing is happening. You were just making it up out of your head. I love this. Love this guy. Nehemiah, he could have spent the whole night worried about it. Stress or not, oh, man, I need to go tell them. I need to go sit down with them. I need to go meet with them at, oh, no, so that they'll understand, no, that's not my motive. Do you think they care if that's his motive or not? No. The enemy doesn't care. The enemy just lies. I don't care what your motive is. They'll just say what your motive is. Nehemiah didn't even fret. He didn't even care. What did he do? He just com uh, confronted them immediately. Tells them point blank, you're a bunch of liars. 
bunch of liars. You're just making this stuff up as you go. Then he walks away and goes about his business, God's business, building the wall, talking about Jesus for us. He doesn't even consider what they said because he knows it's not true. He just refutes it, moves on. When you're moving in God's direction, keep moving. Keep moving. I know I've said that before, but you know what? I read Jesus. He repeats himself a lot, so I'm in good company. When you're moving in God's direction, keep moving. Me and I kept moving. Then we learned he powers up like he always does. <laughs> Throughout the whole book of Nehemiah, he's always powering up. Well, how does he power up? His power drink? Prayer. Prayer. Verse 9. They were all trying to frighten us, thinking, well, their hands will get too weak for the work. Why will their hands get weak to the, too weak for the work? Because they have to deal with all these distractions that they were trying to put there on their way. He said, and it, the wall, will not be completed. Yeah, if they worry about the distractions. But Nehemiah says, but I prayed. Now strengthen my hands, Lord. Strengthen my hands. So Nehemiah says yes to God. He says no to his enemies, and he draws his power, not from the approval or the acceptance of our enemies. Tends to be what the Christian culture does today. We just want to be accepted. We just want to be approved by the enemy culture. Nehemiah says, I don't care about that. I want to be approved by God. I live for an audience of one. I say yes to God. Say no to my enemies. And when you do that, what happens? Well, skip down to verse 15. So the wall was completed on the 25th of Elu in 52 days. You ever been to Jerusalem? Maybe some of you have. A stone wall around even the ancient city of Jerusalem, it's a big deal. Nehemiah and the remnant took just 52 days to build the gates around Jerusalem. We can't even get a permit in 52 days. But in case you're thinking, well, back then it was really easy. Really? They hadn't built that wall in 70 years. The Jews came back out of, they, 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 were, they were in different countries, all of them. They were banished. They were in what's called exile. And they came out of exile back to Jerusalem and stayed for 70 years and left the mess. It took Nehemiah to come and build the wall. In 52 days. When you say yes to God and no to your enemies, 52 days. Verse 16. When all our enemies heard about this, all the surrounding nations were afraid and lost their self-confidence because they realized that this was the work that had been done with the help of our God. Our enemies cower when God shows up. Our enemies tremble when it's clear that God's leading our efforts. They shudder when they see God's hand directing someone. They can't stand it. They don't know what to do. They don't realize that we don't need their agenda. They don't realize that we don't want their influence. And put it in the uh, vernacular of Casey Stingle, don't room with the losers. Don't room with the losers. Say that with me. I never thought you'd say that in church. <laughs> but it's true. Our culture is a losing culture. It's temporary. God will win. But it's a losing culture. Don't room with the losers. Don't let them influence you. You influence them. By your words, by your actions, by your courage to keep Jesus front and center. And help people. Be compassionate for the temporary, but really be compassionate for the eternal. That's what we're going to be about. Always. That's what the Bible's about. We want to be truly compassionate with a meal and a message. The message of Jesus Christ. The message of love and forgiveness and salvation. The message that Jesus is the Lord. The message that Jesus got is control of everything. 
including your life, including your problems. And he's personal God. And he wants to help you daily walk down the road to a wonderful eternity, a better eternity than you'll ever have. And that helps you day to day. That helps your temporary situation. Not any other solution, temporary solution. I've probably said this before. There's like, I can't remember the last count. There was like 365,000 self-help books on the shelf today. People are looking for help all the time. We could either abandon our mission as a church and just go that direction and say, hey, let's help ourselves. Or we could say, we got the answer. Simple yet profound. Jesus Christ, Almighty God, Lord and Savior, Prince of Peace, Lamb of God. Amen? That's our message. That's our message. Let's pray. Lord, I just thank you for Nehemiah. It's a hard message to hear. I know we have people out there with just passionate hearts, and I love that, that are saying, man, yeah, there's a lot of poor people out there, and yeah, we, we want to take care of whoever. But Lord, I pray for boldness. I pray for courage that we don't lose what you want us to do. Go make disciples. Lord, we want to be a church that takes care of the temporary while we're talking about the eternal. We want to be compassionate in what really matters, people's eternal life. Help us to have that boldness. Help us to have that courage. Help us to have that creativity because a lot of times it takes creativity. Help us to do it together, standing shoulder to shoulder so that we can glorify you. And we thank you for the people you've brought here. Thank you for the new people that want to partner with us in being creative, in being bold, in praising the name and sharing the name of Jesus Christ. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. <laughs>